Yeah, so it happened, finally happened. Um, I, I gave over to some of the, some of the things that are in our, our recording queue, you know? So we're, we're direct TV family, so that means we can record stuff when you're not there, obviously. And, and um, so I just wanted to let you know, these are, these are some of the things that you might see in our, in our um, like, uh, shows that we haven't watched yet, okay? I, I can see my list in front of me. Uh, Widow Wonderland, um, Matchmaker Santa, um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, Marry Me at Christmas, and a very merry mix-up. Now, what channel do you think has been on in my home? <laughs> yeah, so the other, here's what happened. It happened. It ha I gave over to it. So most of the time, you know, I kind of make fun a little bit of this situation and things like that. But, but I, you know, I know my wife loves it. And I don't know if it's because of the peace of our life or, or whatever, but, but she loves these type of movies, at least at this time. I have another buddy who loves these type of movies. I'm not going to call him out right now because... He's a guy, and we're just going to leave it at that. But anyways, it happened. I felt like I needed to, like, love my wife. And so I sent her a text that said something about, hey, come home tonight, and, and like, we'll enjoy some Christmas cheese. So that's code word, because, like, these are kind of cheesy movies. It's like, hey, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be, like, a night for, for this, and we're going to get to pick one. So my wife got to pick one, and you wouldn't believe what happened, right? Like, this girl had a fiancé. She, he wasn't right for her, Okay. I know it's a shocker, but he, he was like all businessy and she was all lovey. And um, he was going to come later to the place where they were going to meet. He, they were going to meet his family. And, um, and she, there was a mix up, <laughs> again, another shocker. And she actually went home with the wrong family. And she goes home with the wrong family thinking it's his and falls in love with his brother who's not really his brother. And then they end up together. It's just like this amazing, I, know, I didn't kill, I didn't like, I didn't steal any kind of awesome ending because you know, they all end the same. <laughs> You can tell in the first seven minutes, this guy's going to be with this girl, and this is how it's going to end. So I didn't, I didn't, like, sort of steal the thunder of a very merry Christmas mix-up. But it was interesting because even sort of, like, in our family, who's, you know, we, we, we really talk a lot, try to talk about Jesus and, and all these sort of things that are happening, and this is what Christmas is all about. Everyone, no matter who you are, like wants love. Everyone has this desire to be loved and to love, to be like fully known and still loved. And there are a lot of things that kind of point toward that. The Hallmark Channel just sort of like puts it on a plat platter and, and makes it easy to seize. This idea that we all, we all want love. And at, at this Christmas time, as we think about sort of like what love is and, and where, we, where we find it and, and, and where, where we can safely put ourselves in a love that won't disappoint. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna turn to the scriptures and we're gonna see that uh, the Apostle Paul describes this type of love. He describes what all of our hearts are longing for, although we may know it or, you know, we might not. It's interesting how he talks about uh, this type of love and uh, he talks about it as a controlling love. Now, I, I want to just preface that with, with a situation. Um, not a situation, but just kind of like some information. When I say a love that controls, this is not like an unhealthy love. This is not an abusive, codependent um, love where, where somebody is being manipulated and abused and dominated. I realize that some of you actually have been in those relationships. You may have, been a part, you may have contributed to that, or you may have been a victim from that. And I want to say that I'm sorry for that. I want to acknowledge that's a very real thing. But the love of Christ that Paul's going to talk about here that controls us, it's a different type of control. I was thinking about what kind of, what kind of loves maybe control you right now? I mean, I can, I can remember um, when, when, I, when I first sort of fell in love with my wife, being controlled in a, in a good way by that love. And what I mean by that is I didn't lose my personality. I didn't lose who I was, but it began to reorient me in how I did things. So no longer was I like this single guy who was on the market, right? I was beginning to be controlled by this woman over here, which meant it affected my conversations with other women. It affected sort of how I operated. It, it affected my whole even identity because I began to reorient myself toward this person that I love. I think about that, you know, 22 years of, of marriage later today. The love 
of my wife toward me and the love in response that I have toward her, it controls me in a really healthy way. It dominates like who I'll schedule meetings with, where I'll schedule meetings. It dominates how I interact with other people, especially other females. I watch my language and my, and my wording and, my, and just my vibe when I'm speaking to another female. Because, why? Because, well, because I love Jesus and I wanna give myself first and foremost to him, but because I'm, I'm like taken fully and 100%. It actually dominates how I look and where I look and what I'll watch and whether a commercial gets to stay or go. Like I'm controlled in a really good way, first by my love for Jesus, but also by my love for, for my wife. It brings me home, wakes me up early. It does all sorts of things. And so it, it's an interesting uh, picture, this idea that love can control us in a good and healthy way that I think all of us can relate to. And then Paul, what he does is he just drives it deeper and attaches it to that love that will never disappoint or leave us unfulfilled. And, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, and uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be doing a couple of things here. Um, so if you're turning there, that's cool, and we're going to have sort of our main focus verse uh, on, on the screen. Uh, but, I, but I wanted to read to you, uh, you'll, you'll see it if you have a handout with you, it's at, it's at the bottom of your handout. Um, it's actually the verse that kind of um, s- sort of sets the stage for the whole message. Okay, and um, even, even before I kind of like read that verse, it's just, you'll see it behind me on the screen. Just a reminder that tomorrow we're here at four, and then if, if you have time in your schedule and you want to participate in the seven o'clock or you have like that special invite, we'll be out um, just east of the tree doing Christmas Eve unplugged. So Christmas Eve, four o'clock here with childcare, and then Christmas Eve sort of unplugged. That sort of uh, uh, different type of service that we're, that we're trying is going to be uh, just east of the big Christmas tree downtown uh, in the uh, Pure Life's uh, uh, little courtyard there. So make sure if you have an invite, invite them to the four, invite them to the seven. And if you come to the four, we, that, that'd be the great, a great service for you to come to. If you end up coming to the seven, bring your lawn chair, okay? Because the space is going to be limited. And we're just going to ask that, that you just pray and ask God's spirit to fill that space and, and bring people along uh, who, who might be out walking, walking the ave. Okay, so four o'clock and seven o'clock. Um, love, to, love to see you uh, at, at both, but, but certainly at one of them. Um, so so the, the verse that, that dominates or at least sets the context for what we're going to be talking about today is, is actually found in the chapter after uh, 2 Corinthians 5. And it says this, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Okay, so here's, here's what I, we want to set the stage here, right? Um, Paul is, he's writing and he's, and he's talking to a, a group of Corinthians in that particular church that, um, you know, uh, some of them have sort of s- started to understand like they're a new creation, they do new things and, and they're after sort of like a new pursuit and others of them, they're, they're like a bit out of control, if you will. I mean, this was kind of a church that was cr- like out of control or maybe just controlled by lesser loves. Maybe they were controlled, but they were controlled by an appetite that wasn't pointed toward Jesus. It was pointed toward, uh, toward themselves. And, uh, and, and so this is the context that Paul writes in. And here's what he says. He's like, I want to make sure that the gospel that I've preached to you isn't in vain. Like, you haven't believed it in vain. So the question might be, how do you know? How would you know whether you've truly received the good news of Jesus Christ. How would you know if you've believed in vain or if you, you're believing and it, and it actually is, has come to life? Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to go back a few verses in chapter 5 and we're going to use it as two things. We're going to use it as sort of um, qualifications, if you will, or, or benchmarks. And we're going to go through, you're going to see three things. And if these three things have appeared in your life and are appearing in greater measure, then, then you have not believed in vain. Then the gospel of grace has gripped your heart and is at work within you. And so it's, it's a little bit of like a litmus test, which is always good to take, right? You don't want to be somebody you're not and just kind of live a, a confused life. Like this is a little clarifying maybe for some. For others, it's going to be an invite. It's going to be sort of the first time you've heard about this type of love, the first time you've heard about this type of grace. And so we're inviting you in to receive this type of Advent love that is available 
uh, to all. Hey, so that's, that's what we're gonna be doing in our time. And so this is, this is what he says. I wanna make sure you haven't received it in vain. So back up, if you will, and, and we're gonna be working through 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verses 13 and 15. And this is, um, I'll, I'll read probably a little bit around that to give you a greater context for the passage. Uh, but that's where our, our deep dive's gonna be. He says this, beginning in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, does anybody know it? He's a new creation. It's a brand new critter. The old, the old guy, the old girl is gone, dead, no more existed, has no more value. There's a new creation that's been made. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us, reconciled us. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at this love. Paul says that there is a love that controls us, a love that controls us. So we got a couple of blanks there if you're filling the blanker on your outline. If not, that's totally cool. We'll just kind of work right through it. Hopefully you'll remember these things and they'll stay with you, especially this week. Uh, the first one is, it's a love. We're gonna take a look at this love. This is a love that controls a love that controls. You see that in verse 15, right? If you look at your Bibles, I'm not making this stuff up. Paul writes, the love of Christ controls us, controls us. And again, we talked about well, what does that look like? There's, there's unhealthy control, there's dysfunctional control, but that's not the kind of father we have in, in God the Father. We have a loving father who's for us and with us. And so this is a love that controls and leads us to a place that we could never go without it. But it's important for you to know, and, and again, what are we doing? I'm inviting, the Spirit is inviting some of you for the first time into this love, but for those of us who know this love, it's also a good checkpoint. Is this true in my life, and is it true in increasing measure? Not perfectly, but am I seeing increase in this way? Is the love of Christ increasingly controlling me? Controlling me. Now, first of all, what is the love of Christ, and then what does it mean to be controlled by it? The love of Christ is the love specifically expressed by, by God the Son, Jesus Christ, leaving God the Father and coming on a rescue mission for people just like me and just like you. The love of Christ is specifically expressed by Jesus living a perfect life and going to a cross and taking upon my sin, my shame, my, who, all the things that I know about me that I wish I didn't know, and even the things that I don't know, all the brokenness, all the, all the crimes against a holy God that my heart just perpetually commits. The love of Christ is that Jesus would go to a cross and be crushed in my place, that he would take the penalty that that activity, that that, that character deserved, so that the father, when he looked at Christ, would say, I'm, my wrath, my holy wrath, the holy penalty due, Casey, is satisfied in you, son. And on the third day, he would be brought back from the dead. He would have overcome my sin, which the, the, the resurrection is the, is the guarantee. It's like the receipt that, me, that all sins are paid for because where there is no longer sin, there is no longer death. So when Jesus overcomes that, when he comes back from the dead, he, does to, he proves that everything he said is true and he defeats the penalty of my sin and, and of my death. And then he allows me to get in on that love. The cool part about the love of Christ is I don't earn it. I don't work for it. I just simply turn from the love of self to it. And I say, Jesus, yes, I believe that. I believe you. I want you. And I take a step of faith toward him in that manner, leaving my old self, beginning with Jesus and my new self. That's the love of Christ. It's the love that we're inviting you to today, no matter what you brought in, no matter who you are, no matter what you're in the midst of, even this morning, that love is available by faith and repentance, by turning from self to Christ. Now, how does it control us? 
Well, in my notes, I just wrote something like R.I.P. Casey. R.I.P. Casey, it happened to me when I was 13 years old. None of you are sad about it because I'm still here, but there was a death that happened in our family as a 13-year-old, I died. It happened at Spanish River Church. I heard that same gospel message that's been proclaimed <laughs> ever since Christ's resurrection. And it just, it got me. It, it, it got me, it killed me right there. It was like, I believed it, I received it, and I started walking in it. And the old Casey, who was filled with my own um, sort of like dreams and aspirations, my own way of doing life, like a very like strong will towards this is how I think life should, should turn out, that Casey, he died. He, he fully died. And then the longer I walked in Christ, I began to experience that more and more. Okay, so it's an event of death, like that person died, but then it's also a process where I learn to live now in my new self. At the beginning of that process, I like to go back a lot because that's all I've ever known, even for 13 years. Some of you got, some of you died that death when you were 23. Some of you haven't died that death. Some of you, you were 53. And so the longer you live in sort of this person over here and then Jesus calls you to this new life, Sometimes, not always, but sometimes it, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard transition because you're used to living one way. It's sort of like getting, if you get married when you're 44 like me, that would probably be a harder route than when my wife and I got married when we were both, I was 21, she was 22. We didn't know anything. So just, I guess this is what life's supposed to be. We'll just work it out together. But had we worked out life on our own for like 40 years, it would be a bit of a different struggle potentially. Well, that's how it is when you come to Christ. Do you know that's why, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I think I could probably back this up theologically, so I'll just go out on thin ice here, but that's why what happens in the, in the youth group room and in AC Kids is at least as important, if not more important than what happens here. Yeah. Do you understand? That when, when somebody turns their life over to Christ, when somebody dies as a 13 year old and has that much more time to serve the Lord and be freed from old selfish patterns and behaviors, that's crazy amazing. That's like getting a soldier in the army of the Lord as a 13 year old who begins to all he or she knows is Jesus versus having to live years of undoing unhealthy patterns. It just makes me want to stop and pray for that right now. Is that cool? Can we just do that? Okay, let's just pray. Father, thank you for our AC kids that's happening right now. Thank you for our youth group that celebrated their Christmas party last week. I just pray that you would fill our teachers and our leaders with your Holy Spirit and that you would make your gospel to go out in such a way that it is not believed in vain and that there be many deaths leading to new life even today in Christ's name, amen. So a love that controls, there's, there's, um, there's a death that happens. I am no longer the most compelling voice in my life. I still have a voice in my life. Well, I think I should do that, or I think I should do that. But there's a more compelling voice than me, and it's the voice of the Holy Spirit that lives within all believers, which tells us to go to the left or to the right or to do this or not do this or to wait or to hold on or to move towards somebody in love. There is a more compelling voice in my life than the voice, even I'm a 16 year old, I have a girlfriend, what do I wanna do with my girlfriend? I wanna pursue sexual impurity. Of course, I'm just like a normal guy at 16. I just have a stronger voice that tells me that's not who you are anymore. They compete, but what happens is the longer you walk in Christ the better you get at hearing that voice, learning which voice is which, and being empowered to obey it. There's just a more compelling voice in your life if you have not believed the grace of God in vain. Your life becomes, this is on your, on your outline there, your life becomes more and more unexplainable without Jesus. It becomes more and more unexplainable without Jesus. You start doing things and acting in certain ways that friends around you have a hard time relating to, and they start asking the question, why? I like to start with this one. Um, I, maybe you're familiar with Simon Sinek, and he's got like a TED Talk, big famous TED Talk, and it's sort of like, uh, start with why. If you start with the why, that's a fantastic place to be. And so the, the why 
of the Christian life is the love of Christ, the love I've received from him, which is now generating love back toward him, is what compels me. Now, Paul says, you might, in this passage, he's basically saying, there are times when you're going to think I'm out of my mind. Well, that's, listen, if people don't think in increasing measure you're out of your mind, people who don't know Jesus and they're around you, that's, that should be reason for concern. The more people look at you and are like, why'd you do that? That doesn't, seem, that doesn't seem very comfortable. That didn't seem very, I don't understand that. You, said, just so, I don't, you gave that much money? What, you, did that, you opened your home to that. I don't, I don't, why would you do it? You don't have to. I, the more conversation that is being raised about your life, where people are, are having a hard time um, understanding you, the better. That's just evidence that you have not believed the grace of God in vain and that the love of Christ compels you because like Paul says in this passage, he's like, basically, some of you think we're out of our mind. When you are controlled by other loves, you do crazy things, don't you? I can remember talking on the phone, driving, doing all this sort of stuff when I first started dating my wife. I remember my dad being like, well, you know, you, you, you did have these kind of grades. And no, you know, they're not quite the same. And I was like, dude, I'm controlled, man. I have another love that's now controlling me. The same is true of Christ. And so, it, again, it doesn't have to be huge, like, like now all of a sudden you're living in Africa and, and, and you've, you've gone on mission for, for 10 years and nobody knows. That's it, not always how God's going to begin to make your life more and more unexplainable. It might just mean that you spend more time outside your front door engaging with your neighbor. And then you invite them over and that's super awkward and weird because you haven't done that in 12 years. But you start to read the scriptures where it says, love your neighbor. And you're like, how do I love Jesus and not do this? I don't know. Maybe we should try. It's going to be super awkward. Let's go. Team awkward. Ready? And you get with your family and you pray over it and they come over and then they ask you why. Why? Now, you don't have to be super and awkward and weird and be like, the love of Christ just controlled me, man. <laughs> That's going to be freaky. Okay? So the love of Christ also controls who you are. And, you know, like you can ease into things. You can be normal and like, well, because, you know, we've been neighbors for 12 years and I just wanted to get to know you a little bit better. You know, like, whoa, hit the brakes, okay? It's not, you don't have to go like that. But the more you read the word the more you're gonna find yourself doing things with your time and your talent and your treasure that are not explainable to those people who don't know that love of Christ, but other people who do, they're gonna be like, oh man, you're getting sucked up by that love, aren't you? And it's gonna be a really cool encouragement time. The second way that sort of you know that this love um, gets a hold of you is it's a, it's a love that identifies. A love that identifies. We see this here in verse 17. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is a love that not only controls you, but it also renames you. It says you're different now. I'm not only going to do different things in you and through you, you now are actually a different person. I was having this um, argument with my two-year-old, Cora, uh, the other day. And we were driving to school, and we were, we were having an awesome time, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're into Christmas in our family, and so I figured, like, I'm just going to start talking to her. I, there was no big theological moment here. It's just like, I'm talking to my girl, and, and I said, hey, Cora, I want to tell you something. She'd be like, yes. She's in the back seat, you know, I'd be like, you know, you know what's more beautiful than all the Christmas lights? She'd, be, she'd not answer. I'd say, you are. You know what she said? No. And I'd say, yes, you are. She'd, no. Cora, hey, you know what's more beautiful than all the Christmas songs? Hmm. You are. No. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you saw me driving, you would have thought I was kind of crazy. I'm like, he's yelling in the air, like, no, nah, yes. Hey, Cora, you know what's more beautiful than all the Christmas trees? Huh. You are. No. 
Yes! Hey, Mike, Rob, Foy, Crystal, Garrett, Catherine, fill in the blank. You know that when God looks at you in Christ, he sees the beauty of Christ and not the brokenness that's defined you for years? No. That's what you often say, isn't it? No. You don't know me. You don't know how I'm still struggling. If you knew me, you might not let me do this. You might not look at me the same way. No. And I need you to hear the voice of your father, the love of your father that says, yes, 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 that's who you are in Christ. You see, I, I feel like a lot of us spend our whole lives trying to create a name. You ever try to create a name for yourself? That involves a lot of running around, a lot of activity, a lot of posturing, a lot of manipulating other people so that they'll look at you in a particular way. It involves a high level of performance. But the gospel isn't about creating a name, it's about receiving a name. So don't waste any more energy on trying to create a name for yourself. You're not the point of the gospel of grace. Jesus is. Spend all that extra energy learning how to receive who you actually are and then living out of that identity rather than trying to prove some identity you've always wanted. That's why at this church, man, we talk ad nauseum. Hopefully, I hope you're like sick by the time you hear me talk about belief over behavior. I hope when I talk about the four Gs, which I'm gonna talk about and try to just blow up tomorrow night to some people about our God being like good and gracious and glorious and great in Christ, you can start praying for that even right now. I hope, when, when, when you hear about like, man, inviting people to believe and receive a love that does that kind of freeing aspect in your life versus you always trying to free yourself, man, that's what it means to begin to learn to live out of this new identity, this new character. Now with this character and with this identity, there, it is fair to have expectations. It is, it is fair to have like some standard. The scriptures talk about how to live and how not to live. It doesn't say that you put those on in order to earn anything. It says that you put those on because this is who you are now. In our house, we grew up as Clevelands and there were certain things that Clevelands did and there were certain things that Clevelands didn't do. One of the things that a Cleveland did because you were a Cleveland was when you shook somebody's hand, you gave a firm handshake, you looked them in the eye and it was, it was, I, it was like, boom, I'm here, I'm with you and I, I'm engaging with you. Why do we do that? I don't know why we did that besides, you know, it's probably good etiquette and things like that, but I was a Cleveland. So I knew that this was part of my identity. And, and all, it could be yes, sir, no, ma'am, okay. And so when I didn't do it, I heard about it because that's not how we live. When it comes to your new identity, it's very fair and the scriptures give us expectations of how we now are to live. And it's not to condemn us, it's because this is who you are. This is where Jesus is. This is actually your freedom in God's glory. So when somebody lovingly comes alongside you and says, hey man, I saw this or I heard that, or man, I'm not sure that that's really what you wanna, how you wanna be acting, or, and you talk a little bit about behavior, it's not because the emphasis is on behavior, it's because man, that's not who I am anymore. This is who I am, and there is a new lifestyle that accompanies this new person. Finally, well, before I get there, the word that I wanted to say here is it's a, it's a love that is, becomes more and more unrecognizable. So, so as you kind of like work through becoming this new person and exploring what that means, your, your old life, who you used to be, actually becomes almost unrecognizable to who you are now. Is that making sense? 
so you, you don't know me, and I don't look anything like I did when I was four years old. Most of you don't know me. I'm a different dude, man. I mean, I, I look different, I talk different, I act different. And, and so the four-year-old me is virtually unrecognizable to the 44 version of me. If you have received the grace of God and it has not been in vain, then what's going to happen is the new you is going to be virtually unrecognizable to the old you. Oh man, you remember when you used to do that? It's hard to even remember that. You get around friends and, and they're like, I don't even know who you are. What happened? What does that mean? That means that this love has not been in vain and it's not only controlling you, it's beginning to identify you in such a way that it's hard to recognize the you you were five years ago. Finally, what else does this, this love do? Well, it's, it's a love that motivates. This is a passage that actually sends us out as ambassadors or, or missionaries, if you will. It says, therefore, uh, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you. So, the motivation here for our evangelism, the motivation for us sharing this gospel of grace with others, this love that controls, this love that identifies, um, it, it's not like a program, it's not like a point system, there's no you know, gold star at the end of it. It's because when you've received something so unspeakable like the grace of Christ, when you've really received it, it becomes hard to contain you. How do I know that? Well, I mean, may, I don't know, check out your social media. When something is amazing happening in your life, it could be a, a meal. You're like, oh, hold on, dude. I got to post this thing. <laughs> Boom, share. You might be at a really cool place. It's fake snow. What's up, everybody? Fake snow. Boom, share. You're having like a really cool moment. You're like, ooh, I'm going to video this. And then boom, share. It's like when amazing stuff drops into your life, you know what you want to do with it? You want to share it. That's like a, that's like a God-given, God-image thing. That I don't have a problem with social media because social media, I think there's parts of it that remind me of this is how God created us. When we get something amazing, oh man, we can't stand ourselves until we've shared it. It's almost not even complete until we let all of you in on it. Here's what Paul's saying. Yeah, I got something so much better then all that stuff you just shared, his name is Jesus. He's forgiven you. He's freeing you. He's made you new. He's promised you an eternal destiny with him where everything upside down gets turned right side back up. Man, this is what you have in Christ. I've got to share this. I've got to share this with a world around me that is walking around purposelessness without meaning broken, captive to themselves. I have something that can free you and redeem you and give you life for today, man. Let me just begin to share this story with you. That's our motivation. The love that we've received now motivates us and sends us out. So if you don't find yourself very motivated as an evangelist, then spend more time believing the gospel preaching the gospel to yourself. Listen to songs. Listen to sermons. Get around people who like drink deeply of the gospel and take a, a deeper drink. Don't be motivated because I told you to invite five people to Christmas Eve. Be motivated because you know the radical love of God for someone like yourself. You know the peace. You know the joy of God. And you've got to share that no matter what it costs you. And then you begin to find your life more and more unpredictable. You'll, you'll find that, that you're living this life of unpredictability. I love what um, Leslie Newbegin has to say about this. He says, the deepest desire for mission, check this out, is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is, on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. When the love of Christ controls you, you are gonna not only wanna share that with people because you understand what you've been rescued from and to what you're actually enjoying right now, but man, you're just gonna wanna be wherever Jesus is. 
Well, I know that Jesus is over here with the broken, the marginalized, and the, and the widow and the orphan, so I want to be here. And I know that Jesus is over here, and he talks to those people who have wealth, and he tries to help them to understand, like, that's okay, but I've got something better. And so, man, I just want to be here. And I know that Jesus is with the family of God because he loves us to gather, and so I want to be here. And I know that Jesus is with those who are lost and far from him, those who are angry, those who are bitter, those who are broken, those who are hurting. I know that Jesus always loved the wrong person. He gets so much flack because he's hanging out with the wrong people. I want to be there because I know my great love controls me. And there's nothing greater than drinking deeper of Jesus. And so I got to be there. And before you know it, you will find yourself in really unpredictable places. Doing things you never thought you would do, both with yourself and with your family. I guarantee it. If the love of Christ controls us. So here's where we end. How, how are you doing? How are you doing with that? Do you find that your life is growing a bit more and more? I'm not saying like one day here, next day. I'm saying, do you find a, a, a consistent increase in, in the unpredictability of your life? where you're willing to go places you never thought you would be and, and say things about Jesus you never thought you would? Do you, do you find that you're becoming more and more unrecognizable even to yourself? Like, oh, I don't even remember when I used to do that. Do you find that your life's becoming more confusing to the world? I don't get that, dude. I like him. He's just crazy. Working together with God. It's our desire that you have not believed the grace of God in vain. For some of you, this has been just maybe like a reorientation where it's like, man, I, I need your help, Spirit, for that to become a reality in my life because uh, it's not. That's okay. The love of Christ is still for you, man. It didn't wear out. It didn't get tired of you. Jesus not frustrated with you. That invitation is to the person who's never heard of a love like this, but it's like, yeah, there's a God that accepts me right where I am, I'm in. It's the same love of God that appeals to you who knows it and has somehow maybe become ashamed that you're in a space you never wanted to be. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners to come up and, and we're gonna pray over you. And, and uh, if, if you wanna come up and, and receive prayer in one of those areas, we'd love to do that. And. Uh, We'd love to bless you in that way. And so we'll, we'll keep the music going here. Ruth, thank you for, for doing that. And just want to encourage you, man. Jesus does this. Jesus does this. This isn't going to come from your effort. This, that's why I love prayer partners, because it's like, man, I can't do that. I can't. My life is super recognizable. I feel like I'm the same dude I was five years ago, but I talk about Jesus all the time. I, I love it. You know what? Maybe you're like working out of your own effort and your own performance. And I love the prayer moment because the prayer moment is like, dude, I, I can't do it anymore, but I want it. These guys can't do it. They're just going to pray into you things that maybe have been a really difficult reality for you. So I just invite you to pray. I'm going to close this in prayer and come forward for that. That'd be awesome. And, and um, yeah, we'd love to invite you to that. And uh, just to, as we go, Remember that uh, tomorrow is, it's not just a big day for the avenue. It's like a really big day for the church around the world because a ton of people are going to be hearing the gospel maybe for the first time. And so if you just would spend some time tonight praying for the efforts of churches and then for people like myself who are going to stand up and try somehow to talk about this love of God to people who might be angry with it or far from it. Yeah, would you just pray for that whole effort, that whole gospel effort tonight? And then four o'clock's our service with childcare. And then seven o'clock is that new idea. We talked about it last week, that new idea. We're calling it Christmas Eve Unplugged. Pure Greens Courtyard, have about 50, 60 chairs set up, invite somebody or, you know, if the chairs fill up, bring your lawn chair and come out in the back and pray for us. And be, a, be on mission with us, okay? Hey, I love you guys. I'm going to pray for you now and dismiss us, and then we'll, we'll have our prayer partners here. Let's stand for prayer.
Now, Father, we're thankful for this morning. We're thankful that we were able to gather as an AC family and just um, be centered around your word and filled with your spirit. And we ask that uh, you would help us, Father, to come and receive that love that controls us and identifies us and then sends us out as ambassadors for you. God, we, want, we don't wanna live for ourselves, God. We don't want to do that. So Father, would you help us fill us with your spirit and give us hearts that trust Jesus as savior and treasure and Lord over and over and over again. We thank you for this season where you broke into humanity to do just that. Lord Jesus, we give you great, great, honor and praise in this your moment christ in your name amen love you guys see you